All right, well, I'm here with a priest who needs no introduction. This is Father Frank Pavone. You know him from Priest for Life. He is probably the most visible and outspoken priest in the United States of America. And uh, sorry, Father, I'm getting a little bit of an echo in my uh, in mind. But uh, Father Frank Pavone, welcome. Hey, Taylor, thank you for having me. It's, uh, thanks for the work you do, and it really is great to be connected with you today and with your audience. Thank you. Sorry, there we go. Now, can you still hear me, Father? I sure can. Okay, sorry, we're doing these live ones now, and I had a window open, and so I was hearing myself talking to you, and it was all, all in the echo. So, you know, one of the things we were talking about before we, we ran the, the video just now is there seems to be, I don't want, uh, seismic's maybe too big of a word, but there's a big tide change right now in the past year, maybe two years, in the pro-life movement here in America. I have felt it. You agreed. Um, what do you think that tide change is and what's causing it? Is it political? Is it the unplanned movie? Is it just social media and people seeing these graphic pictures of abortions? What's going on where even people who aren't religious or aren't Catholic are starting to be pushed more and more against the uh, abortion agenda? Yes, your, your observation is correct. A lot of people are feeling this. I, I, I say it this way, that abortion is at a boiling point now in our country. It's always been controversial. It's never been settled, but it is at a boiling point now. Some of the most immediate triggers of this were, of course, the New York law in January, where people began to realize for the first time something we've been saying for decades, that abortion is, in fact, happening legally right up until birth. And a lot of Americans just didn't realize that or find that hard to believe. But the abortion, the New York law went even further, removing protection from babies born alive after a failed abortion. Then a number of other states have followed suit with similar laws, Illinois, uh, Rhode Island, Vermont. And uh, the, 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 the fact that then at the same time, you've got some states like Alabama, uh, Georgia, Ohio, passing more protective laws than ever before, yes. protecting ba babies earlier in the so now we've got this, these, the divide that was always there is, is becoming wider and more intense. So more people are, you know, I talked to my colleagues in pro-life leadership, and, and we're all experiencing the same thing, that more and more people are coming to us and saying, hey, I want to get involved now. I, I, I've, I've awakened to this issue. But the dynamics that are contributing to this have also been uh, in play for a good number of years. I've been giving a talk for some 20 years about the, why the pro-life movement is winning. Mm. We have seen, for example, over these, oh, I've been leading Preach for not Life now for 26 years. And when I began, we had over 2,000 freestanding abortion facilities in the United States. Wow. Now we've got about 600. Mm. So the, 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 the rate of decline, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a very encouraging uh, fact. Abortion as an industry is collapsing. And together with that, we see it as a mentality collapsing. Opinion polls are moving more and more in our direction. And the political winds are even moving in our direction. And President Trump, whom we'll, we'll talk about in more detail as we have our discussion, is a big part of that. He's um, the most pro-life president we've ever had. He's done things that even previous pro-life presidents have not been able to accomplish or haven't been willing to accomplish. He's changing the courts. And the direction of the courts in a pro-life direction is making the pro-abortion side very nervous. And it's like they're saying, let's grab everything we can right now before we no longer have Roe v. Wade as a protection. Uh, and it's emboldening the pro-life side to pass legislation that maybe in the past they've been in favor of, but they've said, well, the courts are going to strike it down. Maybe it's not the right time. Now they're feeling like maybe the right time has arrived. Yeah, and do you so do you think what what came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it because the pro life movement on a grassroots way became more and more uh, successful, or is it that the radical left pro abortion people overplayed their hand and it caused a reaction? How do you how do you see that those two? Which is first? There is a dynamic happening first, which um, two dynamics. Number one. Those who have had abortions, and this has been it's like been a rising tide mm. now for many years. When you think about it, the longer we go with with legal abortion, the more people are impacted by it, right? The more Correct. people know from experience 
What is it like to have this procedure? And then what's the aftermath? Uh, not just the moms who have the procedure. We gotta think about the dads. We gotta mm. think about the impact on the grandparents. How many grandparents out there wow. tr tried to save their grandchild from abortion and couldn't, or alternatively, actually forced or pushed for the abortion, and now they're grieving. The friends, a uh, friend drives a friend to have an abortion. Well, not only is that, that mom gonna suffer, that friend is gonna suffer grief and regret and, and remorse. And, and then you've got the, the siblings. We're, we're learning a lot about how abortion impacts surviving children of, the, of, those, of those parents. So what I'm saying is that there has been this um, a, every, day by day accumulating uh, shared experience of grief, pain, despair, and people have realized abortion didn't solve their problems, it only created new ones. One of the things we do at Priest for Life, as some of our viewers know, is we, we, we oversee this um, Silent No More campaign. So we give a platform to those who want to share their experience of having abortion. And, and what I've been noticing is that if we see a change uh, if, in public opinion, if we see abortion becoming less popular, if we see more people getting involved to stop it, one of the big reasons is simply experience. People have seen around them in their families, among their friends, the devastation abortion brings. There's another current that's connected with that, but distinct, the survivor syndrome. What does it mean to a young person to realize at some point in their young life that they themselves were not protected when they were in the womb, that their life was considered by this, this Roe v. Wade policy to be a non-person, that's got to have a terribly devastating effect. And we're starting to see that. We're starting to understand. And psychologists and psychiatrists are getting in on the, the research that the kind of symptoms you see from soldiers returning to war, from war, where you've got this survivor anxiety and survivor guilt and a number of other syndromes are manifesting themselves just in our young people just because of the fact that they realize they've survived abortion. These dynamics are contributing to all the other things we were just discussing, the progress, the, the boiling point now that we are at. As far as the pro-aborts overplaying their hand, they've always done that. Uh, hmm. They've always done that because they... I mean, they don't have a conscience I and mean, they are. I mean, if you can actually justify in your own mind killing a baby, mm. you don't care about anything else either. I mean, you can do anything. So part of the judgment that they lose is how far they can go. They, they've already gone farther than any human conscience should be allowed to go. And so they over always overplay their hand. And we certainly see that happening with these recent laws. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting now, because when you think of the time period, we're now talking about three generations. Yeah, we have we have grandma, ma and daughter now. And yeah. uh, so it's it's, you know, and I I've seen situations I've been in front of Planned Parenthoods and I've seen mothers driving their college age girls into the gates of Planned Parenthood, you know, at Christmas. Yeah. time. And so this is an intergenerational thing. And you know, I've also, uh, you know, spoken to a young lady whose mom basically made her, you know, go have an abortion. And so there's this vulnerability. This is not something I wanted when I was younger. It was pushed on me. And it's not what you see, you know, celebrated in Cosmo or any of these women magazines that make abortion seem like no big deal. Or even sometimes they, they're they pushing it so hard, like you said, Father. It's almost like glamorous. Yes, and, and that's the very and sad. the people who have experienced realize this is this was not a no big deal. It was not no. glamorous. It wasn't part of a lifestyle. It was bloody. that's why that's why these campaigns from the other side like shout your abortion. Yes, you know? and, and and there was even a campaign some months ago at making jewelry, celebrating mm. abortion, celebrating Roe v. You know, it, it just goes to show how the, the the folks that are doing this are just two things happening. Number one, they're just disconnected from the actual real experience of those who have abortion. Because of those who have an abortion, this is offensive. You know, yeah. uh, their pain is being ignored and minimized. The other thing that could be happening among some of these people uh, is that they are trying to cover the pain of their own abortion. And, and we've seen that happen many times as we work with, uh, with those that have had abortions. And I, I'm privileged to be pastoral director of Rachel's Vineyard, which mm. is the largest abortion healing ministry in the world. And people that come on these healing retreats, 
you know, they say this all the time. They say, you know, uh, when I, once I had, when I first had my abortion, I was trying to overcompensate and I was trying to make it appear like a good thing. And I was getting other people to believe the same thing because that was easing my distress over what I did that I really deep down knew was wrong. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the things that's a little bit more uh, controversial is the role of President Trump. Now, President Trump, yeah. he's not a Catholic. Uh, right. I think he would even say he's sort of a nominally Christian uh, Protestant. And, you know, even going into the election, we knew he wasn't a canonized saint. <laughs> we knew that he has serious uh, uh, moral baggage and a history, but oddly enough, he has been one of the most pro-life presidents, perhaps the most pro-life president. Um, why now? Why this man? What has got up to? What do you think, Father Frank? Pavone? Well, I I agree with what you said. He is uh, he has done things uh, that even past pro-life presidents have not been able to do. For example, simple example. You know, he reinstated the Mexico City policy. Okay, we're protecting our tax dollars from 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 funding of abortion internationally, but he didn't just reinstate it as previous uh, uh, pro-life presidents have done. He expanded it. He expanded it to include to go right across all government agencies, and and he expanded it to cover a whole lot more money that the abortion industry would not get. And 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 we've seen this pattern time and time again in all the to the policies that he has uh, done. And I know that, that, I mean, I've had a chance to talk with him several times about, about pro-life specifically. In fact, I was just with him when he relaunched his, uh, his, he launched his reelection campaign in his uh, rally in Orlando. Uh, and I was invited to that and, and got to greet him before he went out onto the stage. Mm. Uh, the man is, is exactly what we need. When we, when I say we, those of us that believe the baby should be protected. Those of us that believe the church should be free to be the church. Those of us that believe in the values of America. We have a man here who is not only thinking clearly about these issues, but he's a warrior. I think one of the reasons he's president is that of the American people and the, you know, the six million voters that came out to vote for him who hadn't voted in a decade or more, and they put him over the edge in, uh, in 2016, over the, over the victory line, um, came out because they noticed, they saw, they heard, this is a man who makes it clear what he believes in. He's willing to tell us clear and straight without political double talk and evasion. And added to that, he's a fighter. He, he's a warrior. He, and, I, and this is, I think, what motivates, certainly motivated me to vote for him. And, and this is what motivated, I think, millions of Americans who, like I say, they hadn't come out in over a decade to vote. Why not? They're tired of establishment politics. And uh, in fact, we see the same dynamic, I think, in the church. People are tired of establishment church leaders that can't give you a, a clear answer about anything. And, and, and don't want to fight for anything. President Trump is, is just the opposite of that. And I think not only that's why he was elected, but that's why he's going to be reelected, because he yeah. hasn't changed. He hasn't yeah. changed. And the need for that kind of leadership hasn't changed either. Yeah, there's uh, one of our viewers today. His name is David Van Vranken, and he, he writes this comment. Neither Cyrus nor Constantine were virtuous men, and yet they did God's will. And I, this is a biblical principle right. uh, that, that runs all through scripture. I mean, even when you look at, you know, the patriarchs and you look at the life of Moses and you look at the life of King David, there are some serious moral failings in yeah. those lives. And yet we as Christians, we as Catholics believe that even St. Peter, who denied our Lord three times, even in our brokenness, even in Mary Magdalene, you know, God can bring out his will. And sometimes he chooses to do that so that he gets all the credit. Yes, exactly. You know, it, 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 yeah, exactly. And those are good parallels, you know. And during his campaign in 2016, people were asking me this question: "Oh, the moral failings." And, and here's an example I use. I said, "Listen, if I need surgery, I want the surgeon to know what he or she is doing when they open me up. I really don't care how many times they've been married." I don't care what kind of language they use. I don't care what their past moral. Are. I want all I'm asking is that they're a good surgeon. I go to an auto mechanic. The same is true, right? I want to yep. make sure you can fix my car. 
So with a president, what are we looking for? What are we asking for? We're asking for someone who's going to sign the right legislation, veto the wrong legislation, appoint the right kind of judges, defend America, do the, the job description of a president. That's now, right. Does that, does that mean yeah. virtue doesn't matter? It means it's not the point. It's not the relevant question. Well, you know, I use a similar one. When a plumber comes to my house and there's slime coming out of a pipe or something, I don't... It'd be nice if he could quote like the Summa Theologiae and Thomas Aquinas have a conversation, <laughs> but I really want to know: Can he fix my pipe right That's now? Right. And of course, I exactly. want every every person on earth to love our Lord, love our Lady, uh, attend Mass, receive the Eucharist, go to confession, all, love Thomas Aquinas. I want every human being. But when it comes to certain tasks, it's sufficient that they're willing to get the job done. Well, and 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 not only that, there's another perspective too. It's one thing if a person has committed moral failings in his or her life, and, and who hasn't, right? But when we look at the opposition party, when we look at the candidates right. running against President Trump, they want to take those immoral activities and actually write them into public policy. Well, uh, for example, you know what the president is doing to secure the freedom of the church, to be the church, to preach the message without government interference— how much virtue is that going to promote and, 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 and create? When the president puts judges in place who are not going to create rights that don't exist in the Constitution, um, and rights to a whole lot of immoral activity, or, mm. and he's going to take money away from Planned Parenthood, that's yeah. promoting an awful lot of vice, um, instead of what the Democrats would do, which is to fund that vice and put judges in that are going to write this immoral activity into public policy, you know, those that are thinking primarily about virtue when it comes to these elections, eh, that should be a motivation to, 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 to vote Republican because these, uh, these Democrats are they're completely off the track when it comes to, again, and now this is not in their personal life. This is in public policy, right. public life. Yeah, they're promising. The Democrats are promising to extend abortion. Now, you've, you've met the president. You've met President Trump. Yeah. Yeah. A, there's a lot of questions and uh, comments running through here because I, I think a lot of Catholics have an earnest interest in Melania Trump, ah, who is yeah. raised Catholic. And I'm just curious, have you been, were you able to meet her? Uh, what's her take on Christ, the church? Is, she seems to have had rosaries and, and she's been pictured, I think, with Our Lady of Fatima statue. So something's going on there. Um, what is going well, on there, Father? Well, Melania I, Trump I, and, and Catholic yeah, Church. Yeah, Melania, I have, I have met with her, her close aides and her advisors. I have not had the pleasure of meeting her. Okay. I, I, I know the president better than, than I know her. But everybody right, everybody her, out there, start praying that Father Frank Pavone meets the, uh, the First Lady. Everybody out there, <laughs> we want 10 Hail Marys. Give a decade to Father Frank Pavone that he meets Melania <laughs> Trump, the First Lady. Wouldn't that be uh, great? That'd be great. I, Let's storm I heaven. I deliver you. Know, one of the people that works with me every day is uh, is uh, Alveda King, uh, Martin Luther King's niece, and so she's on our team at Priests for Life. President loves her, oh, and uh, she uh, she made um, uh, 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 well. We brought Alveda, and I brought a prayer shawl uh, for Melania, uh, and 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 uh, brought it to her her staff, and uh, they received it with such gratitude, such obvious. Um, conviction that, hey, this means a lot to her. Prayer means a lot to her. Faith mm. means a lot to her. And that's what I've picked up in, in all my contacts with the people that do know her well. I can tell you, though, the same is true of the president. You know, I've talked with pastors who have ministered to him personally and have told me that they have, they have encountered few people. In fact, one of them said, I don't know of anyone that is more open eager to learn the ways of the Lord, to receive the ways of the Lord, to be open to the Spirit, the power of prayer, than President Trump. So he is uh, and has been on a journey. And I always say, you know, the office shapes the man. The man doesn't just shape the office. The office shapes right. the man. And when you're in the position of President of the United States, I mean, you've got to have a deep sense of your your dependence on God. I mean, that's, that's got to be a big a molding factor once you're actually sitting in that Oval Office. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, there's all kinds of people now saying, people, we're praying a decade for you, Father Frank. <laughs> Thank we're, you. We're paying a whole rosary for you, and it's really cool. It's great to see everybody uh, chipping in here and, and praying for your intentions. So we've seen this big shift. Um, 
some people are ascribing it to the unplanned film and this sort of hitting mainstream and, and, and people seeing this not just, you know, on the sidewalks outside of a Planned Parenthood, not just hearing it maybe in a homily, but actually seeing it out in the public. And there's been a lot of protest and debate and all that. Do you think that's also playing into it? What's your take on, on the unplanned film and the, yeah. and the influence and all this? Well, it, it, this goes back to your, your question about the chicken and the egg. Now, I was actually very involved in the story that Unplanned tells. And okay. I can tell you a little bit about that because yeah, the dynamics, the dynamics of what happened with Abby Johnson and what happened with 40 Days for Life are in fact themselves a big part of the reason for the, uh, the shift that we're seeing, the pro-life shift, and for them to be crystallized and put on the screen in the way that Unplanned has done has simply well, the way I would describe it is this. It's accelerated a dynamic that was already there, but it, it, it poured fuel on the fire. Now, the dynamic of what happened to Abby, uh, she, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I've got a regular programming on EWTN. And, yes. and uh, she was actually, when she was still working in the abortion industry, she was watching my programs on, about pro-life, about okay. abortion. And one day I was standing in front of, of that clinic where she was the director, praying outside with the 40 days people. She looks out the window and she says to her colleague, hey, that, that's, I, I know that priest, that's Father Frank. You think I could go outside and say hello to him? And they said, are you crazy? You can't do that. But <laughs> what was happening within her, you noticed that there was a push and a pull. She was listening to me talk about the very work that right. she did and revealing the, it for the evil that it is. And yet there was a certain attraction there. And this is what's happening in the minds of heart and hearts of abortion practitioners everywhere. They're not, we should not be fooled by them coming across as, oh, I'm confident about what I'm doing. I'm sure I know what I'm doing is right. They, they know that what they're doing is wrong. Right. And they're deeply conflicted. So that when someone can approach them with, with love, with compassion, with saying, hey, I know what you're going through. And um, you don't have to do what you're doing. That's one of the most important messages they need to hear. And as happened to Abby, it's happened to hundreds of people. They've come out of the abortion industry. Now, when she came out, I was one of the leaders she came to. And we began immediately talking about what the, the first task we have when people come out of the industry like that is to bring them healing. The yes. first task is not to put them in the spotlight or behind a microphone or leading right. around. We've got to get it because they have deep, they are deeply, yeah, deep damage. Fragile. And yeah. so they are, they are. So Abby and I worked together to bring her through a, a good amount of healing. And then immediately when her book came out, on which the movie was based, of course, uh, the book um, began to circulate and other people, People were already coming out of the abortion industry, and we were already ministering to them uh, from years and years ago. But um, but I, I uh, worked with Abby to, to bring some of these people into that path of healing, and so things grew from there. Now, 40 Days is a story in and of itself, 40 Days for Life, because uh, I helped that team in the development of that, launching that from a local to a national initiative. And they asked me, you think this will work? You know, you think we should try to do this nationally? And what I said to them is, was this, because I had already been traveling around for 20 years doing this full time. I said to them, listen, it says, you, you start this nationally and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like igniting a powder keg because what I observed everywhere I went was all sorts of people, clergy, laity, young, old, families, individuals saying, what can I do mm. about abortion? I was seeing that thirst. And that's why our ministry grew so quickly in the 90s and, and, and since then, because people were already, they were feeling this need to do something. And that's the beautiful thing about the pro-life movement. It arises from the grassroots. It arises yes. from the heart and conscience of ordinary people. And as people felt this burning need, I said, if we can organize something that would bring them out to the abortion facilities and increase, if you will, their, their comfort level in doing that, and this is one of the things 40 Days for Life does, we will have a, a, a tremendous victory because not only will we be giving them something to do, but we'll be pressing against the abortion industry at its weakest link. And its weakest link are the clinics themselves, as I mentioned to you before. So many have closed, and the people who are running them are so ambivalent and so conflicted that if we go right to, into where they are, 
we'll get a lot of them come out and we'll get a lot more of these places to close and therefore a lot more lives are saved. Absolutely. Some of the people are asking, uh, we've seen so many closures. What about the, do you know the numbers on the pro-life crisis centers and, and their growth over time, maybe from the 70s? You they, said, I think, uh, you said 3,000 to, to two, 600? Two, or? 2,000, approximately 2,000 to 600 okay. with the abortion, abortion. In the USA. In the USA. The pregnancy centers have uh, uh, at the same time been on an upward climb. Right, right. now, there are we say that there are approximately 3,000. So really, you think about it, the pregnancy centers at 3,000 outnumber the abortion clinics five to one. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a magnificent praise dynamic. God. Yeah, praise God. And, and they have been consistently growing. Uh, when we took pregnancy centers, of course, take on different sizes and shapes and colors. Uh, and so you've got the uh, counseling centers. You've got some of them are full blown medical clinics. And that's another another area of growth is more of the pregnancy centers are being transformed into medical clinics. And that increases their rate of success. And then you've got a growth also in the maternity homes. In fact, there's a new network of Catholic maternity homes. Uh, and this is a beautiful development in the movement. And folks like Chris Bell with Good Council Homes is instrumental in that. So, yeah, that all continues to grow. And that is such a it's such a beautiful thing because people, you know, I'm sure a lot of our viewers, when they're arguing with somebody about abortion, you know, a good talking point, And it's completely true, is the bulk of the time and energy and resources of the pro-life movement are devoted to precisely to helping those who need a good alternative to abortion. And, and right. that should be a source of great pride for us. And by maternity homes, you mean places for these mothers to live with their child, their baby. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. I've seen this in Dallas. The uh, The missionaries of charity have a um, have a home, and, and we've, we've been there, and, and you see moms there with their babies, and, and they're, getting, mm -hmm. they're getting their food and their diapers, and it's just a, it's a beautiful testimony to the pro-life movement because – I was once talking to a local pastor, and we were actually talking about um, Islam and Muslims being saved, his whole theological, and he, he was very uh, liberal and, and very odd. And at one point in the conversation, he got flustered. He goes, that's the problem with you fundamentalists. You never take care of the mother. We weren't talking about abortion at all, Father. We were talking wow. about theology wow. and Islam and monotheism, and he just... He immediately attacked me on the pro-life question. Isn't that something? Yeah. It's crazy. It was di I think it was diabolical. I think it was demonic. And I said, Father, we're not even talking about abortion. And he's like, well, that's the problem with you fundamentals. You have these hardline views, but you never help anyone. I said, well, I said, I'm not going to brag or boast, but I give money and help with young moms and pregnant women and crisis center quite a bit and volunteer exactly. and, and donate. And so, I mean... That's, I think, a, a, a wrecking ball that they try to use against us, yes. right? They think yes. we're just on you know, Twitter saying, oh, all these women are going to hell, abortion's evil, blah, 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 blah. They don't realize that there are amazing networks all over the country, in every city, every town, crisis pregnancy centers, uh, donations, donors, uh, help with adoption, help with the mothers who want to keep their babies and raise their baby in a very difficult situation, maybe it involves poverty. The pro-life movement is not just people on Twitter or Facebook complaining. I mean, it's, well, it's a right. big deal. And that's, I, I like big... your message because you're also pointing this out. And I don't want to get too far in like seamless garment. Like we also have to promote, you know, social housing for everyone. And, and maybe we could talk about that as well because, um, it's important for the other side to realize that we're not just rhetoric. We put our money where our mouth is. We do. And, and, and that's where, you know, when people say to me, well, what do you do for, you know, these children after they're born? I say, well, first of all, we've given them their whole life. If we saved them from being killed. And, and secondly, people who say, oh, well, you know, my, we've got to work. It's more important to work for good education and good health care and, and all these other things. Well, we agree that those are important issues. But what happens when you take away the life of a baby in the womb? You've taken away her education. You've taken away her health care. It doesn't yep. make sense for people to be advocating for those things, but tolerating the killing of those very same children in the first nine months of their life. It just, it's just, it's, right. it's, it's, it's a self-contradictory position. Yeah. What do you, we've seen in, uh, well, since since the election of Pope Francis, we've seen a lot of bishops, even cardinals, um, 
subtly, I would say subtly attacking uh, the pro-life position that you hold, that I hold, and moving back to Cardinal Bernadine's seamless garment idea, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Where is that coming from? Why is that happening? And, And what's your perspective on that? You know, first of all, it's a big it's a big mistake because uh, there is, in fact, in the church's teaching itself, and, and I'm thinking here not only the catechism, but the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, a beautiful, nice, thick book that came out uh, in the early 2000s from the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. In fact, the president of that council at that time, Cardinal Renato Martino, uh, is is a friend of mine and has been an advisor to Priest for Life and and yeah, so as you can imagine he I mean he makes it very very clear you can't even have a discussion about any other kind of human rights unless the right to life is secure so the whole foundation the whole fabric of the church's social teaching is the right to life and the dignity of the human person uh, to 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 go to move away from that. I think a lot of it is politically motivated because we have the unfortunate scenario here where we've got uh, the two major political parties so, so polarized opposite on on abortion that many people feel like in order not to offend my my Democrat friends and allies on whom I'm relying for any other kinds of projects or help, uh, I will be silent on abortion or or in order to elect. You know, and we see it now in these election cycles more and more, this, this move back to this seamless garment idea. Uh, it gives cover to, to, to pro-abortion Democrats. You know, oh, I'm, I'm pro-life because I'm, uh, you know, with you on these, uh, all these other social issues. And I say to them, no, you're not. Yeah. Not, only, not only is abortion the most important and fundamental of the issues, so that if you're not right on that, you know, it's no excuse for 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 uh, being right on other issues is no excuse for being wrong on abortion, as the bishops themselves have said. But does it? I go deeper than that. I say, unless you have it right on abortion, you can't be right on the other issues. And, and that goes back to the point we we're making a moment ago. How can you say that healthcare is a basic human right when you're you're all too willing to take that human right away from the children whose human right to life you're taking away? Right. You're, you're taking away their health care, too. So where it's coming from, I think it's, 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 it's often motivated by political loyalties. And on its face, it needs to be challenged uh, for its, um, its, its absurdity. It's self-contradictory to uh, – sure, it's not about saying we don't embrace the other issues. We all have to be concerned about all these other issues. But to fail to see the interconnection and the dependence they all have on, on acknowledging the right to life – is a massive failure that undercuts all those other efforts. Yeah, without life, you have no other rights. There you go. It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's amazing. And you even, I mean, Father. Sadly, we hear this coming out of Rome. We hear this coming out of the Vatican. These ideas, you know, that well, another way they'll go about it is they'll say, well, okay, you're you support uh, anti-abortion measures, but if you don't also support list these, you are not pro-life. That's another what another wrecking ball, right? Like, if, well, for example, if you're not in agreement with uh, open borders, you're not pro-life. Yeah. And so they kind of you try know, to take away the voice of the strong voice of the pro-life movement by attacking these these other issue other issues. Which, again, unless you're actually born and have a life, you can't cross any border, <laughs> right? So you can't that's cross the, any border. That's yeah, right. yeah, you and that's. That's the first border you have to cross. The border is of the, the womb. Womb, yes. <laughs> you know, it's good that you bring this up because, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's so true that people are just distorting this whole thing. Again, it's politically motivated, but the word pro-life. Uh oh, I lost you, Father Frank. Can you hear me? Oh, maybe your your earbuds went out. Let's see. Um, I don't hear you yet. You're probably going to have to ch- to change your mic, which will be in your Skype. Oh, here we set. go. There we go. You're back. How you, can you hear me now? Okay. Yep. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. Well, these are recharging. But the point yep. I was making was the term pro-life has become too big for its own good. 
And wow. uh, when people call us anti-abortion, I, I, I'm proud to be called anti-abortion. I, I, I would have loved to be called anti-slavery in the days of slavery. Exactly. You know, yep. Anti-segregation in the days of, of segregation. So, um, and, and, and it's very helpful because we have to, we have to specify, you know, uh, there's a difference between a vision and a mission, mm. as you all know. You know, what's our vision? Uh, what's our preferred future? Well, our preferred future is a culture of life, a culture where life at every stage from conception and natural death is protected and valued and respected. OK, that's a vision. That's not a mission statement. A mission statement right. is much more specific. All right. What is this group or this movement going to do to accomplish a specific aspect of that preferred future? And the mission of the pro-life movement is very specific. It's to take the children in the womb in the first nine months of life and restore to them the protection of their life. That's a big enough mission for an entire movement, and, and it's a big enough justification for people to be focused on that uh, as their mission and as their work. In my case, and in the case of many people, our life's work, our full-time work. Mm -hmm. So, so the 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 um, th there is a hijacking, there is a dilution. I mean, if you're going to take this term pro-life and make it include every issue under the sun. I mean, why is any issue an issue at all if it doesn't affect life? I mean, pot, clear, right. fixing potholes in the in the in the streets is a pro-life issue, really. Technically, right. it is. Right. Uh, uh, but you know, the movement has a specific meaning. Right now, do you? Th it's interesting you bring up the anti-abortion because for so long we wanted to have no a non-pejorative title, but you know, is there any merit to starting to use anti-abortion as a slogan? Do you think there's some maybe some political traction there? moving forward very much well yeah. very much because because uh it, 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 i've been advocating it as a matter of fact okay. using that term more not not abandoning the term pro-life but you, you making it more and more clear that in this movement what we mean is anti-abortion we should be proud of that and because also of the dynamics we discussed earlier that you know the other side is becoming and the other side i mean the abortion advocates and the democrat party are becoming more and more unashamed of the fact that what they want is abortion on demand without apology. Now, a lot of times when a pro-abortion politician gets up to defend abortion, you'll notice they talk about everything except abortion. Yeah. They don't really talk about abortion. I, I, I would challenge any of our any of our friends who are listening to us now. You know, when you talk to your uh, uh, people in your life that are in favor of abortion, or you listen to what these speeches that 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 justify it, find me a speech where a politician is advocating for abortion or the legality of it, where they actually describe it. Mm. Do they ever describe the procedure? If I'm sure I mean, if we took all the speeches of all the, the current the current uh, politicians and you go back to Obama and Hillary Clinton and all their speeches to Planned Parenthood and in favor of abortion or all the floor speeches, you know, I'm, I'm sitting right here across from the Capitol here uh, in D.C., all the floor speeches that are made there on this topic, none of those who defend the pro-choice position ever describe the procedure. You will not hear the word forceps or or right. arms and legs or crushing right. of the head right. or dismemberment, decapitation. Those words won't appear. You right. know where those words do appear? In the medical textbooks of how to do an abortion. So it's like, hey guys, if you're gonna if you're if you're too ashamed to even describe what you're supporting, maybe you shouldn't be supporting it. Correct. Correct. Um I want to go back to the unplanned movie. Some people are asking, yes. why weren't you in it? They should have had a character, a father friend. Should... <laughs> I, I talked to Abby about that. I said, you okay. know, that would have been funny if, if we had included that whole part of the story. Yeah, yeah. The more Catholic side. Now, Abby was on uh, a few weeks ago, and we talked about these states. And uh, you sound great without the headphones, Father, if you want to, if you want to keep, keep not using the headphones. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, but we talked about, can you hear me, Father? You could not use them. All right, can you hear me now? Are we good? You hear me or not Not hear me? I don't hear you. Let's see, can you, um, you don't hear me? Sorry, Father Frank is changing his headphones there. If you, 
Let's see. I'll send him a Everybody st hang tight. He's having some problems with his headphones. I'm going to send him a quick message here. Um, uh, nope, don't hear you. Uh, I'm telling him it sounds good without the headphones. There we go. Can you hear me now? Is it back? I know. I wish I knew sign language so I could I could tell them in sign language that sounds good. Um, I'm going to do switch. Oh, he's going back. Switch mic to not headphones. <laughs> uh, everybody's leaving some pretty funny comments here. We need to have the countdown music play right now while we wait welcome to all the new people coming in sorry Fa father um has he's has his headphones but i think the the charge on him the battery is out so oh, just, oh can you hear me now yes i can hear you now all right i can hear you too okay <laughs> okay so sorry do you have the technical do, issues do you have the headphones in or do you have the headphones not in i got my ear pods in right now okay because it sounded pretty good without them i, I think if if they're going to go out again let's just not use them okay what do you think can you, okay. Do you think if you pull them out, it'll it'll work, or do you want to try them? You say, I'll try to pull them out. Okay. Oh, no. I just lost them on Skype. All right, I'm going to pull them back in. Everybody just hang tight. See, this is our third live uh, broadcast. And so let's get them back. It's kind of neat that everybody's still on here. We're not losing the... All right, maybe we just there we go. Yeah, that's here. good. That's go. good. I think back to business. <laughs> I think when the uh, when these headphones, if you if you put them back to your ears, your Skype signal is trying to find them again. Uh, I and see. So when you go back and forth, I think Skype gets all confused. So I think just yeah. leave them out. It sounds good. I think sounds it sounds. Good. Everybody thinks it sounds good. Yeah, they say it sounds good. Everybody, everybody stayed put. Okay, so what were we talking about? We were talking about you were you were going back to the unplanned movie. Yes, and so we were talking with Abby, you know, okay, so we have these states who are putting in these measures. What happens when these go to the Supreme Court? We always thought of it as like an overturning of Roe v. Wade, but what if we actually have these state cases going up higher and higher in the court system? I mean, how does this shake down? Have you, have you with your staff or in your mind, you know, traced this out of how it could go and, and could it actually yes. go against us? That was kind of our concern, that we could yes. actually lose yeah, we, um, in fact, I'm looking at the Supreme Court building right now as we speak, our office yes. here in D.C. is right across the street, and we've delved into this quite, quite into quite a bit of detail. Uh, what people should understand, first of all, is that the Supreme Court has issued many, many cases, dozens of cases on abortion since Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And it's very instructive and very, actually very encouraging to look at that whole trajectory of decisions, because what these decisions overall have done is to weaken Roe v. Wade very substantially. Now, the justices on the court right now are certainly ready to continue to weaken it. Um, at what point they would be willing to completely reverse it is very hard to tell uh, because the issue here is, you know, not only was Roe correctly decided, but what kind of... Um, role does the court see that it has in making a big change like that? A lot of these justices are saying, hey, go over to that Congress over there and uh, start making the changes that need to be made. But as you say, the state laws are a very big topic. A lot of these, these subsequent uh, uh, abortion decisions by the court have in fact dealt with state laws. And let's look at one of the most recent ones, the Hellerstead decision of just a few years ago, coming out of Texas, was talking about a, 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 a law, a very reasonable law, saying that the abortion facilities in Texas should meet the standards of other ambulatory surgical facilities. Now, we're talking about things like regulations about how much emergency medical equipment they have, 
uh, yeah, how many hand sanitizers need to be in the building? I mean, things that m I think most Americans would figure are already in place and well provided for. But we know the abortion industry is corrupt. Like, uh, like I was saying before, you know, if, if you can, if your conscience allows you to kill a baby, right. you're not going to care about sterilizing medical instruments. I mean, there's going to be yeah. a lot of, you, you can't practice vice virtuously, is how I always say it. So uh, the point I'm making is this. The court actually struck down that law. And the ridiculous argument of the abortion industry was, well, whether or not these facilities are up to these standards, closing them, and, and here's, here's their argument, you, you, you require them to live up to these standards, a lot of them are going to close, which of course should be a red flag to begin with. Yeah, but when exactly. they close, the women in Texas are not going to have anywhere to go to get abortions. So that because it would be a, a burden for them to get find a place that does an abortion, that makes the law unconstitutional. And so they just jump right over the fundamental question of, don't you care about the health and safety of the woman who goes there for her right. abortion? Now, I bring this up because when we think about where's the court going to go next with, with these various laws, they have got to deal with this undue burden standard. In other words, what that court, the reason the court struck down that very reasonable Texas law is that way back in 1992, when Roe v. Wade was almost overturned, they came up instead with a new standard. They kept Roe in place in its core holding, and, and, but they come up with this standard that says anytime a state passes a law on abortion, we have to see whether it's gonna create an undue burden for the women of that state to get an abortion. Mm. And this has made, this has put the court into the abortion umpiring business. That mm. every time a state does something, they have to decide whether or not it's an undue burden. If we get, and I think a number of the justices are willing at this point, if we can get to the point where they say, you know what, let's get rid of this undue burden standard. And uh, let's just put a reasonable basis standard. If the state has a rational basis for, for, for passing a law like Texas did, well, that's their prerogative. It's not up to us to go in and, and try to second guess them. They're closer to the, to the reality of the situation. Let the legislators do what they're supposed to do. Let the governors do what the work they're supposed to do for their, for their people in their state. Uh, and that would get us to a point where a lot more of these laws could be sustained and a lot more lives would be saved, even yeah. if the even if some of the basics, even if abortion basically is still legal, the states will be able to do a lot more to, to save lives. Yeah, good. You know, we didn't, we talked about Unplanned and, and someone asked about the Gosnell. Film. Oh, yes. Yeah, wow. I mean, this is just part of this push where everything is coming out in the public. And uh, I mean, do you think we'll see more films? I mean, is just this the first two of there dozens? Is a, I, and I was involved also in the, in the creation of the Gosnell film. In fact, okay. I was sitting in that courtroom. Okay. Uh, I, sat right about behind, the, yeah. I sat right behind Gosnell, as a matter of fact. Wow. And the way, I'll tell you what, Ann and Phelan, they, they, who created that film, they came to me and various other pro-life leaders when they were first creating it to get input, advice, etc. And they did an absolutely fa fantastic job in conveying exactly, first of all, the personality of Gosnell. Mm. Uh, when you watch that movie and you see that, 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 that smile that he has, like, oh, everything I'm doing is okay. Sure, I'm killing a baby here, I'm killing a mother there, but oh, I, this is, this is, I am, I'm not phased by it. That's exactly the way he was. He sat in that courtroom with that grin on his face, and you got to say, well, how dehumanized the person has to be uh, yeah. to, to react that way it was exactly the reality of it. And and I'll I'll say something here, which is a guiding principle. Everything we need to know to end abortion is inside the abortion industry. Wow. And, and, and that's an interesting thought. What, uh, what it means is the more we can rip the veil off of what's actually going on in these clinics, the more uh, the American people will rise up and say, hey, wait a minute, this is even the people who say they're pro-choice, this is not what we have in mind. What, when people say that they're pro-choice, they don't support Gosnell-like abortionists, and he is not the exception. He's the norm. 
using unsterilized instruments, expired medications, untrained staff, no regard for the very lives of women uh, 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 that come to him, um, uh, facility not properly equipped to handle medical emergencies, et cetera, et cetera. This is going on from coast to coast. And, and and we've been involved over the years in efforts to to dig up this 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 stuff, and it's being exposed not only in movies like Gosnell, but in various books and other reports that are being done. We need our viewers to understand this is the norm in the abortion it's industry, nasty. and the more we can show it to people, the more they'll 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 get on that'll get on board with us. There are other movies in the preparation. One is called Roe versus Wade. Oh, whoa, yeah. Nick Loeb, actor himself and longtime Hollywood uh, professional, Nick has put together this film. I saw an initial screening of it. Hopefully it'll be ready in the fall. But what it focuses in on is the, um, the strategies that both the pro-abortion people led by, by Bernard Nathanson at the time, who later became pro-life, uh, and on the other hand, the, uh, the, the, the pre people on the pro-life side like Dr. Mildred Jefferson and the folks that started National Right to Life, it shows the, 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 how the two sides crafted their strategy and then how the case itself unfolded and was decided. Good, fascinating movie, fascinating movie. Mm. Good thing for our, our listeners to also pray for that for the success, yes. the successful completion, because it'll make the American people much more aware of what that case was and how it came about. Right, and it, it's a sketchy situation. It yeah, is. It, it is. is. <laughs> now, uh, one of the things, I mean, I might, I might get a little ticked off and emotional here, because one of the things that's really set a fire under me was the whole New York debacle, Cuomo, oh, the Cardinal. Why is it that our bishops and cardinals don't have spines? You know, Won't say sad? a word. Cuomo, it, 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 who claims to be a Catholic. Yeah. And it's my just, home state. Yeah. New York my home I mean, state. riff on I, I, it. Let's yeah. go off. I mean, this is ridiculous. The, the Catholic it, people outrageous. are enraged. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one outrageous. thing to be against abortion, but we have our leaders, the men with red hats, which signifies martyrdom, mm. can't mm. raise their voice one bit against this ungodliness in the church. You know, well, tying in, first of all, to something we were discussing earlier, of course, the importance of the, the upcoming elections. Uh, I remember Cardinal Francis Arinzi, who's a Vatican cardinal, being asked this question, this very question, uh, one time when he was speaking, I was at a talk of his here in America. And he turns to the audience and he says, well, you know, he says, you do have a solution to that here in America, and it's called elections. So he was, he was saying, first and foremost, if the faithful Catholics... And, and I think one of the reasons they're so annoyed at this, uh, as are you and I, is that, hey, we we make sacrifices to live our Catholic faith. Yes. And, and, and these Catholic politicians, they want all the benefits of being known as a Catholic. Right. And then they throw the, the demands of the faith out the window. But he said, he said, first of all, let's think of the burden and the responsibility of us as voters. Get these people out of office in the first place. That that that's number one. Then, as far as the church's response, you know, sadly, I, I, I'm sure Taylor, you saw the, the Cardinal Dolan's response on on Fox uh, uh, News yep, Channel. I watched it. You know, and it's like he what he said there was basically it won't work if we discipline these people. It'll backfire. Uh, it won't work. And 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 I've talked with bishops clear across the country on this this issue as well. And there's a very strong consensus among them that that, uh, that that's the case. You know, it's a, it's it's sad because you know at the same time, obviously, we all have to take into account the cost and the backfiring of not doing something because then people are scandalized, they people are are disheartened, people are again making sacrifices not only to live but to spread the faith. Are are saying, well, are we serious about this or not? I'm not a bishop. I mean, they have to make these decisions. But I can say one of the things I as a priest try to do as a pro-life leader and that every practicing Catholic can do, take the words that the bishops have already said. And I, I refer in particular to a document called Living the Gospel of Life, it was issued by the whole body of U.S. bishops back 20 years ago now, but still as valid as ever, talking about uh public officials who claim to be Catholic but take a pro-abortion position, how it's harmful to their souls 
it's harmful, obviously, to society. And it doesn't only contradict their Catholic faith, it contradicts the meaning of public service. We need to elect public servants who know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. And it's at that level that even the Catholic position on abortion starts there. It starts on that natural level of human reason that this goes against the very purpose of government. So if we can, I think, part of the way of solving this, this, this frustrating problem, let's take what the bishops have already said, and let's make sure it doesn't get forgotten. Let's, let's shout it from the rooftops. Let's, let's encourage our priests to preach on it. Let's, let's quote from it in our articles and publications and broadcasts. Because living the gospel life, it's not a long document. It's not a complicated document. It is strong. It is clear. And it's right to the point that you're, uh, that you're raising here. Yeah. I mean, as a, you know, to go back to what Cardinal Dolan said, you know, his eminence said, well, it won't work. That doesn't really matter. I mean... You can say, well, if I preach the gospel to everyone, not everyone's going to be saved. Well, last time I checked, we were called to preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah. Right? So we're called to be faithful. The results are God's. Mm -hmm. We have to do what's called. It's it's almost like saying, uh, you know, well, I could tell my kids don't eat ice cream before five o'clock, but I mean, they're going to do it anyway. So it why, even, <laughs> why even enforce it in my house? You know, yeah. and what that does is, okay, so maybe I have one wild, crazy kid who's going to try to do that. But then the other seven kids say, oh, dad's not really serious about disciplining this one wild kid. There what does go. that do to the other seven? What does that do to the other hundreds of millions of Catholics who are watching New York, watching Cuomo, watching this t entire debacle, and they see dad do nothing? Yeah, yeah. They see dad, you know, just go get in the bass boat and go fishing and, and let this horrible problem fester in the church. It is a discouragement to all of us who are trying to be followers of Jesus Christ. You know, and, and there are there are a number of bishops who have spoken up clearly about this. Uh, Bishop Paprocki in Springfield. You know, I'm not going to allow communion for these pro-abortion politicians. Uh, this Bishop Strickland out in Texas, who's been very strong. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think what we need to do is let's let's support this strength when when we see it. Uh, and, and, you know, it goes back, doesn't it, Taylor, to what we were discussing at the beginning of the program, the reason President Trump got elected. People were tired of this sort of evasive kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. They want a clear message and they want a warrior. Yes. I believe they want the same in the church. Precisely. And, you know, we don't we don't elect our bishops, but we can certainly pray for and encourage them uh, and let them know the kind of leadership we want. Yeah, I mean, it's it's odd because it seems that in 2019, when we're recording this, that the American bishops have become softer than ever on the abortion issue and in the political sphere. And yet we're having this tide change. Yeah, and we have a yeah. non-Catholic president who's being one of, if not the most, most pro-life presidents, anti-abortion president. So it's it, it's confusing. It, it yeah. is. It, it is. Well, that's why I, I, you know, I issued a call the other day, uh, and I, I've made this call over the years, for people to to jump full time into this pro-life battle, leave their professions if they're if they're at all able to, because I think this is stirring in a lot of people's hearts, hmm. and devote those skills, whatever they are, to the pro-life movement, because this is, I mean, this is the anti-slavery battle of our day, this right. is the, and this is the civil rights movement of our day, as our colleague Alveda King always says. This is the moment. People are going to look back at this age, they're going to say, oh, that was the age of abortion. Where were the hmm. people that fighting against it. And they'll find us, they'll see us, but we yeah. gotta make sure they see a lot of us. And uh, no, it's it's so true. And that's why, of course, you know, my, so many people are encouraged by our ministry and we're so grateful to them for that because they wanna see leadership in the church. And we at Priests for Life, you know, we're trying to pick up this slack, uh, you know, and we're trying right. to say, yes, the church does have a message here. It's clear and all of us need to carry it together. And if we're in a season of weak leadership in the in the hierarchy, well, you know what, let's do everything we can to pick up the slack ourselves and just shout that message all the louder. That's right, we need warriors. Now, Father, there's been certain bishops who have been, um, been uh, what's the right word here? Careful or even opposed to Priest for Life, oh, to yeah. 40 Days for Life. Yeah, uh, public statements, restrictions, all speak to that. What the heck is going on when you got priests I, and lady, but especially priests who are like, 
let us end this tragedy of abortion. It's like, let's end slavery. And then you have bishops like, no, stop saying that. Yeah. These guys I, are going to go into history books as the greatest villains of all time. It, 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 I, wish I, I wish I knew. The, pro, the problem is there. Uh, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, my challenge to them is this. You got a problem with what we're saying or what we're doing? Come clean. Say, identify the problem. I've had people, you know, bad mouthing me both in the church and outside the church. And it's like, you know what the, what the issue is? I don't have an issue that, okay, they're opposed to what I'm doing, what I'm saying, fine. You know, you don't go into public, the public spotlight and not expect, you know, opposition and, 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 and uh, uh, people saying things against you. All part of the territory. My problem with them is the lack of honesty and the lack of transparency. So you have a problem with what we're doing? Tell us what it is. And we're happy to have that debate. You know, some some bishops have said to me, oh, Father Frank, you know, you're you're too aggressive on abortion. I say, as soon as abortion stops being aggressive on those little babies that it kills, exactly. then come and talk to me, you know. And, and if they if they say that's their problem with me, good, we can have that debate. Or some of them have said to me, oh, well, you just endorse Republican uh, uh, candidates. And again, my response to that is, listen, I'm, I'm giving the pro-life message. Whether that helps a Republican or hurts a Democrat is their choice. <laughs> yeah, what right. position that's they're right. going to... My message isn't going to change. Right. They're the ones that got to take the right position on this. So it's like, okay, if they identify, you know, like, what, what's their issue? We can debate that. And, 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 and I'm confident that we, we can answer all those objections. But it's when these people operate in the shadows, and sadly with the sexual abuse crisis in the church, hmm. we've seen all too much of this. Where, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to handle this or we're going to take care of that. And meanwhile, nobody knows what's the process, who are the people involved, what's the timetable, where's the accountability, where's the transparency. Well, it's the same with the matters that you're bringing up when, when if they oppose a pro-life effort, 40 days for life, priests for life, whatever it is. It's like, hey, guys, come on out of the shadows and act like adults and tell us if you've got a problem, or, you know, we can respond to. But it's like this, 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 this working in the dark that gives a bad name to the church. Right. Do you think that we have, over the last 50 years, that we have had uh, corrupted uh, priests and bishops and even oh, yes. cardinals in the church? Yeah. Yes. Throughout history. Throughout history. Throughout right? history. I mean, start, yeah. Starting with the apostles, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, I mean, do you think that with, for example, let's just go to Cardinal Bernadine. May God rest his soul. Yeah. You know, he came out with the seamless garment and that that is sort of provided cover for a lot of Democrats, as you said earlier. Um, was that, you know, was that a Saul Linsky tactic? I mean, was there was it was it an accident of history or was it actually a purposeful attack on life, on the dignity of life and on the teaching of the church? You know, that is a question that, that I know various people are, are asking, historians, theologians, mm -hmm. people concerned about the church are looking at that question. I had some personal interaction with Cardinal Bernardin. In fact, he allowed one of his priests to work with me full time in Priest for Life at the very beginning. Um, I saw a lot of... Um, the su sincere support that he gave to, yeah. to efforts like ours. But you never know. I mean, I, right. I, I wouldn't say I know for sure one way or another on that very important question you just raised. But I think that it's uh, certainly, certainly uh, there are those around, uh, again, I think operating mostly in the dark, that will take what he said, and whether that was his original intention or not, they will try to use it as a, a battering ram against uh, against pro-life. Yeah. Yeah. Also, just a, a final question, unless there's something else you want to cover. Um, what about the mainstream uh, American voter, Protestant, non-Catholic? It seems to me, for the first time in my entire life, I'm talking to in-laws and families and friends and neighbors, and they're not Catholic, but they have taken, in the last year, a great interest in pro-life politics. All, yeah. I think it's pro-life politics, uh, the LGBT and marriage and traditional family, it's almost like your, your conservatives have woken up. Yes. And, and it's now like we're having conversations, you know, at the block party and, and, and next to the grill. And it's kind of, it's, it's really encouraging to me. And, and 
Where is that coming from? Are, are Protestants getting more involved in this kind of work, or is it just because of the films and social media? I mean, why are these people who aren't Catholic and haven't been at it for, for decades like you have finally coming to the conversation? You know, the, one of the things I always say I like most about the pro-life movement is that the fact that it is in, so interdenominational. I get to work mm -hmm. with so many of these these uh, evangelicals and their leaders. A lot of it is good leadership among them. Uh, you know, James Dobson has been leading the charge for so many years. And now uh, Franklin Graham has been rising to yeah. the occasion. Uh, uh, Tony Perkins is a good friend and, and ally. I, I know a lot of these guys uh, up close and, and personal. They've got the fire. You know what they always say to me? They say, you know, we have such gratitude to the Catholic Church because you guys were in this from the beginning. You were on the right track. They have a sincere appreciation for that. Right. Uh, and they realize that you can't live the gospel in America today without confronting these issues head on. You, re you really can't. It's, it's, uh, it's not we who have chosen the battle. The battle has chosen us. And uh, I think they, they, I know, they realize that. They're calling their people to do that. And I think, you know, it's interesting that the division between denominations, you know, in the past, it was a, a, a vertical divisions, you know, so the Catholics were different from the Baptists, different from the Anglicans. The, the division now among the denominations is horizontal that I'll have more in common with the Baptist pastor uh, uh, across the street there than I will with, with someone sitting in my own congregation yeah. who doesn't, for some reason or another, accept the biblical worldview of things. And I'll be going to a pro-life event or organizing a pro-life event, and the Baptist pastor and the evangelical minister, they'll be standing with me side by side, and some Catholic priest will be criticizing me for doing the event. That's that kind of horizontal division that we mm -hmm. have right now. And you know what? Long live the division. The problem is not that we're divided. The, the issue is, are we on the right side of the division? And, and uh, you know, let the division flourish, uh, but, but, but let those of us on the right side of it become stronger and stronger. That's the bottom line. Amen. Amen to that. Well, Father Frank Pavone, thanks so much for, uh, for being on today. I've put on the screen uh, the website. It's nabortion.us. Yep, that's our main so every, website. Everybody can see that on the screen right now. And then your book, Tell us about yes. that. This is uh, abolishing, abolishing abortion. abortion. This is a manifesto I Amen. wrote. It came out in 2015. And uh, what does the church need to do? What does the state need to do as a next step in ending abortion? That's the overall question. The book asks and answers. And you'll see it. You know, it was written in 2015. And a lot of what has transpired since then, a lot of which we've been discussing in this program, uh, has come to pass, has proven true. I think it's a great roadmap for anyone interested in, you know, how do we get from here to there, there being the abolishment of abortion. Yeah, I like you're using abolishment because it evokes the slavery. Yes. And nobody wants to be on the wrong side of that debate over time. I mean, exactly. people want to remove statues all over America on this issue, right? And yet abortion is the killing of killing. the person. And the fact that people want to defend this, it's, it's ridiculous. So... The book is Abolishing Abortion, uh, Amazon.com, bookstores. Yes. Okay. Yes, and, and, and there's AbolishingAbortion.com as well as the main okay. website of the book. Yeah. Okay, so there's AbolishingAbortion.com, and then, the, and then the site that you want to promote is EndAbortion.us. US. Yep. US. Okay, great. Well, Father, I always uh, I love it when our priests can end us with a, a prayer or a blessing, so I'll ask yes. you to do that. And before we do it, I encourage everybody to subscribe to this channel, like the channel, but especially this is such an important issue please use the share button and share this video on facebook on twitter um, tag father uh, pavone tag me we need to get the word out we need to we need to get people charged up and i think this video has shown a lot of excitement and energy so please share that and um father please a, a blessing or prayer to end us Absolutely. Well, may the Lord send his Holy Spirit upon us all. May he send his spirit, Taylor, upon you, upon your work, your audience, your, your, your broadcasting. May he send his spirit upon all those uh, who, are, who are listening and upon our entire nation. May the spirit who is the advocate fill us and make us advocates for our youngest brothers and sisters, the children in the womb. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Father. We, we truly appreciate you coming on and sharing your time. And I encourage everybody to follow those links. And uh, hopefully we'll do this again. It's been fun. Let's do it again. Let's I'm do at it. your service. I love, love what you're doing and uh, happy to be with you today. Good. And then everybody, pray that decade 
for Father Frank Provone for his ministry, and also that you meet Melania and the president again. That'd be great. All right, signing off, everyone.